when I was a kid, I loved TV dinners. You had a section for your Salisbury steak, a section for your mashed potatoes, a section for your corn, and another for your fruit compote. For me, I especially liked that all of the components of my meal were perfectly separated. Never once did I think, maybe I need a hypervisor to manage all these separate delicious dishes. But maybe I should have. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Yes, my culinary tastes have come a very long way since those days of frozen food meals. And so has the processing in our electronic designs. No longer are our system functions nicely partitioned into their own processing sections. Now multi-core processing is all the rage. But how do we take advantage of this new kind of processing? I'm glad you asked. My guest today is Jeff Hancock from Siemens, and we're talking about all the challenges inherent in multi-core processing, what hypervisors and multi-core frameworks bring to the table, and what you need to consider when choosing your next multi-core processing solution. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Siemens. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about heterogeneous multiprocessing today. But before we get started, Jeff, why is there a need for this kind of processing today? Sure. So the semi guys, they've been listening to us over the years saying we need more compute power. We need more resources. We need more from the software side of things. And their answer to this is to give us what we asked for. So it's one of those be careful what you ask for kind of scenarios here where now they're providing us with the system on a chips or SOCs that give us these really high compute application cores. And you may have dual core, you may have quad core, you know how many cores, but then they're also throwing in there things like real-time cores or safety islands or other things along those lines that have some dedicated functionality, GPUs, DSPs, FPGAs that may have soft cores in here. So now you can start to look at this and go, whoa, okay, so now I have all this huge compute power. How can I start to really leverage this? And so that's when we talk about heterogeneous multiprocessing in SOCs, that's what we're talking about. You have this mixture of all these different types of cores. So it could be these application cores could be ARM Cortex-A level devices, and these real-time cores could be and ARM Cortex R or M type devices out there as well. And so from a software perspective, we now need to think about how we take advantage of all of this uh, heterogeneous goodness that the semi guys are now starting to provide for us. That makes sense. But multi-core processing presents us with a new set of issues to work through, right, Jeff? Oh yeah, it definitely brings a whole lot more challenges and things that we need to think about as we're designing software architecture to really take advantage of all of the goodness that the semi guys are now providing for us. Some of these challenges could be, hey, now I have these heterogeneous type cores that in the past I had different devices out there or different systems running on different devices. And so now I can leverage these heterogeneous offerings and start with system consolidation down there where I have different now systems all running on the same heterogeneous SOC. And if we expand beyond that, well, heck, now if we're combining systems, they don't have to be like systems as it pertains to maybe things like functional safety. We can now even start to go beyond just consolidating systems, but now we can have the concept of mixed safety criticality, which is both a safe world and a non-safe world, running on a single SOC. Now with these heterogeneous offerings, as well as capabilities that the semi people are providing with the isolation and separation, now we can actually have these mixed safety criticality environments on here. So when you start to think about that, beyond some of the hardware capabilities with isolation, now what from a software standpoint are the things that I have to do to ensure the safe side and the non-safe side don't contaminate one another. So a lot more challenges start to come into play here. And so by doing that, some other things that we have to think about here is also some utilization. So how am I efficiently gonna use all of this compute resources that I have on here? 
separation. Some of the, the separation in safe world and non-safe world, but heck, it's even maybe running different operating systems in this environment as well to how do you ensure that you have that required separation that you may need. And then obviously there is still a limited set of resources, so ethernet and other things along those lines. So we still have to think about resource sharing and utilization as well as separation now all in this heterogeneous environment here as well. That makes sense. So Jeff, what kind of solution should we be looking at here? There's a couple of different solutions that are looking at. So one of them happens to be using a hypervisor. So what does a hypervisor give us? Well, hypervisor gives us this supervisory way of managing things on top of cores. So it's usually a layer of software on top of the cores themselves that give access to the CPUs, peripherals, interprocessor communication. It does provide a level of isolation out there as well. It takes care of the boot sequence of the different operating systems that are maybe, or guest operating system, guest OSs. It does give the user a little bit of protection. So if one operating system crashes, it doesn't bring down the entire system. It's one of these things that is really nice, especially if you're consolidating systems, to be able to leverage the different capabilities the hypervisor can have here. So some pros here, people can leverage all of those things in a nice supervised way. The hypervisor manages a lot of the context for them, be able to assign ownership or direct passage through those shared resources or peripherals out there. Now, some of the cons over here is it is an extra layer of software. Your operating systems aren't running directly on the cores themselves. Typically, they're small, they're fast, but you know there is a little bit of extra overhead, both in code size, footprint, and just execution. Like I said, not a lot, but there is that extra layer core there. Typically, hypervisors also run on homogeneous cores, so light cores. Not to say that it can't run on heterogeneous cores, but it's not the norm, so to speak, to really leverage these heterogeneous multi-cores that we're talking about. Hypervisors may not be the right solution to cover all of the cores. And there is a little bit more of complexity here when you start to talk about, am I sharing devices? Am I doing pass-through communication all between the different operating systems here? There does give you a little bit of complexity there. And also creating virtual drivers and, and the like. Okay, so Jeff, what are we looking at when it comes to a multi-core framework? Multi-core framework is somewhat new. It's really designed for these heterogeneous AMP type of applications where you can run the operating system directly on the cores. They're set up to do that. It handles basically two main components. There is the boot mechanism. So how are you gonna boot up this system? As well as once the system's booted up, how are you gonna manage the communications between the different environments that are over there? The beauty of this is this all runs natively as well as cross heterogeneous cores. So you can have Linux running on application cores. You could have a real time operating system running on these real time cores and still be able to do the boot sequence, still be able to do the communication between all the two, all with really small overhead, gives you all the benefits of having the ability to run directly native on the hardware itself. So What's really nice is it gives the designer more flexibility because now they can really leverage the full system, taking advantage of the application cores, real-time cores. But you're not limited just to heterogeneous cores. You can also use multi-core frameworks across the board. They're homogeneous cores as well. So maybe you have on these quad-core systems, you have bare metal, a real-time operating system, and a Linux all there don't have the need for an hypervisor there, you could still run a multi-core framework. So the other nice benefit, it doesn't really have that underlying need, that extra software layer like a hypervisor would have. Some of the disadvantages though is that when you talk about resource sharing, you really have to be conscious of which operating system is using what. Nice thing is you can still share peripherals and everything like that. It's just you may have to go through a channel in an operating system to be able to access that. So maybe Linux owns 
maybe the Ethernet, where you could have a virtual I.O. on the real-time cores going through the Ethernet of the Linux side of things. So there is a little bit of a downside from that standpoint, where when you're talking about sharing and resource management, there may be the need for additional hardware protection when you're trying to do the mixed safety criticality. With a hypervisor, it has natively the management to be able to isolate the different environments. With the multi-core framework, especially if you want to obtain a mixed safety criticality, you're going to want to rely on additional hardware functionalities, other types of capabilities that really can, through the hardware, separate the different cores, memory, peripherals, things along those lines. Now, obviously, from a software standpoint, there's going to be some things that you need to leverage well, but be able to support those, that is going to be a little bit of a downside with the multi-core framework. Or an advantage, depending on how you look at it, because sometimes hardware is a little bit more reliable, and you can trust that isolation a little bit more than maybe software. So it could be a con, but it also could be a pro. Some examples of multi-core frameworks is OpenAMP. It's an open source project that really is driving these multi-core frameworks. Uh, here at Siemens, we have our Nucleus multi-core framework. That is a commercial offering of OpenAMP. We're a founding member of OpenAMP, and we actually take the existing OpenAMP, we extend it to add some additional functionalities, like the proxy Ethernet support. And we also offer a certifiable version. We're in the process of actually getting this certified as we speak, that really can enable these mixed safety criticality type offerings. I talked about the hardware separation, but also when you start to look at, from a software standpoint, there are gonna be some things like buffer validation and main gate interrupts coming in, things along those lines that you're gonna to need to be able to prevent when you're talking about safety and non-safety, and that's where our multi-core framework cert offering comes into play. Okay, so Jeff, what factors should I consider when taking the next step here? Sure, and this is always that fun question, right, as a software architect is, okay, I have all this compute power available to me, getting these pesky product managers, giving me all of these requirements, now how am I gonna implement this and what's gonna be the best solution for this? Hypervisors, you know, as we talked about, have their advantages, right, so if we're looking at a system where you're really more focused on having those homogeneous type cores. You maybe don't have a mixed safety criticality type requirement out there. Uh, a hypervisor solution would work great for you. Multi-core framework, maybe you don't have as much requirements from an OS perspective, or you want to enable this mixed safety criticality uh, to really leverage all of these cores you could go with a multi-core framework option over there as well. As well as there's some scenarios where you can actually have a mixture. That's the, the beauty of these heterogeneous environments is you could have a hypervisor running on these application cores. You could have a safety RTOS running on these R cores. And you could have a multi-core framework cert example bridging the gap between those two environments. And so it's a powerful combination and really comes down to what your needs are. Okay, so we're also talking about mixed safety criticality, as you mentioned earlier. So, Jeff, what kind of systems would fall into this category? Anytime that you have some type of functional safety requirement and a non-functional safety requirement and you're putting them on a single device over there. So I'll use the common example that just makes things real easy for us. So think about these brand new vehicles that are coming out and you got in your car and you're looking at the dash, right? And there are some things on the dash that if they go out, it's super annoying, right? So, oh, bummer, my radio station isn't working right now. Super annoying, but doesn't really cause any harm. Now, as soon as you maybe put the car in reverse, all of a sudden that screen pops over and it is now showing a backup camera. That now has some functional safety ramifications here. If the camera goes out, yeah, you know, you still have your mirrors as a backup, but, you know, you're not getting the full view, especially if you're driving one of these big SUVs that are out there, right? And so to be able to have that, you need to have some type of functional safety over there. And so now combining these onto a single main controller is going to become more and more common out there. So you're going to have some safe components and some not safe components. 
Okay, so speaking of components, Jeff, what kind of components are we talking about when it comes to these kinds of systems? I have one component that is a functional safety software. The next component would be non-functional safety, kind of general purpose uh, operating systems or operating environments. Obviously, we're gonna have to have some type of communication between these two type of environments, as well as to the outside world. You need to think about the booting of the system. Do I need to have secure boot capabilities or safe boot capabilities? And so as we're creating this mixed criticality system, we need to think about that. Because we have the different criticality levels, we absolutely need to think about isolation. How am I going to isolate the safe world and non-safe world? either through a temporal or spatial type isolation out there. We need to have hardware verification and monitoring for the system. We need to think about error handling and fault type capabilities. So if faults happen or errors happen, how are these things gonna be handled? And then finally, resource management. Since they are being on a single SOC here, we need to think about, okay, how am I gonna leverage or how is the system gonna leverage the different resources that we have that makes sense. Now, Jeff, I'm really interested in the isolation component that you just mentioned, but what is the difference specifically between temporal and spatial isolation? Keep it really simple, right? Think of temporal as just dedicated independent cores, whereas uh, spatial is more thinking about uh, hardware protection units that are there, right? And the beauty of these heterogeneous type environments is they give us the opportunity for both. Obviously, dedicated independent cores, application cores versus real-time cores. There's just by the nature of that, there's some isolation. But then adding these hardware protection units or hardware firewalls out there that can really help with additional separation, that now gives us that capability not only to separate the cores, but things like memory and peripherals and other things along those lines that helps us give the system-wide separation and isolation for the user. That makes sense. Now, can we talk a little bit about the communications aspect of this as well? Sure, so that is the big thing, right? So you can think about in-vehicle gateways, right? So that's another application for a mixed safety criticality type solution where you have maybe the non-safety side that's connected to the outside world to get a firmware update, and then it's communicating the other part of that gateway is talking to functional safety type devices in the vehicle. So we have to figure out a way of passing between the safe world and non-safe world, but we need to do it in, ironically, a safe way. So the communications is super important. You just can't open up a pipe and just go, there you go, kind of thing, because there are some things that can happen that from the non-safe world could have an impact on the safe world. So some of the things that you have to look into are things like buffer validation, making sure that the parameters such as address and size and permissions are holding true across that communication lines. Other things you need to think about is, hey, if for some reason the non-safe world goes berserk and starts really flooding the system with a bunch of interrupts, that could, if you're not taking the proper precautions here, have an impact on the safe world. And we don't want that. So you need to be able to put things into place here to mitigate things like interrupt flooding. Okay, so can we talk a little bit about what it looks like to use a multi-core framework and a hypervisor in these kinds of complex mixed safety criticality systems? Yeah, so let's just start from the hardware perspective, right? We have a quad Cortex A53, some application cores, and they're gonna design that area to really run our general purpose or non-safe side of things. And then, you know, on the other part of this SOC, we, let's say we have a dual core R5s, and those are designed for our functional safety aspect. So we're running something maybe like a nuclear safety cert. Let's say we have an ACL B requirement on the functional safety side, so these are R cores. And so we have nuclear safety cert running on their cores. Maybe it's connecting up to some cameras and other things along those lines that have uh, this ACL B requirement. But then on that same device is maybe you have a display that is needing to show some graphics and other things out there that you may want to run something like a Linux. So Siemens Sokol Flex OS, which is a Yocto-based type Linux offering. You may want to run an Android on there. That's becoming more and more common 
in vehicle situations. You also may want to have just some things that run in an RTOS capability. So in this case, maybe we'll just use a regular nucleus or maybe some bare metal. And just because we want to make this as efficient as possible, we'll run maybe the Linux and the nucleus and the bare metal all directly on a hypervisor. So we could use our nucleus hypervisor to be able to serve those guest operating systems up for whatever needs over here. So you can see we're now taking advantage of all of the hardware compute power that the SOC that we've chosen provides to us. Then we're gonna enable through like a secure boot or safe boot mechanism, some other parameters to help us with memory isolation and peripheral isolation, things along those lines. So now we actually have a system booting up that gives us all of that temporal and spatial isolation here, but now we need that software side of things to help with the interrupt flooding, to mitigate those things, the buffer validation, things along those lines, and that's where the multi-core framework CERT product can come into play that really opens up this communication between all of these different heterogeneous environments, be it a Linux, an Android, or an RTOS, bare metal, as well as a functional safe certified operating system running on these safety cores. And so with that, that would be a nice architecture that you could start to really then write your applications to really take advantage of all of the goodness that the hardware is now providing underneath there for you. Okay, so Jeff, this has been a lot to take in today, but can you give me a recap of the highlights of these multi-core solutions? Yep, great question here. So if we look at that, we've talked a lot about different technologies, especially for multi-core specifically, you know, we've talked about hypervisors, the ability to run multiple guest operating systems across homogeneous type environments with some level of supervisory type functionality being the peripherals and the cores underneath to multi-core frameworks that really enable the true power of heterogeneous cores out there both from communication standpoint, but also from a boot standpoint, as well as to really leverage running these things directly on the cores as well. And then finally, we talked also about mixed safety criticality and you know leveraging the hardware isolation that's provided there, both the separation of the cores, but also memory and peripherals and things like that. But also from a software standpoint with the multi-core framework CERT, that handles a lot of things like the buffer validation and the interrupt flooding and things along those lines, all to be able to provide the end users with these solutions for multi-core out there. And as we also talked about in safety certified type environments, to really be able to leverage something like the multi-core framework cert that is actually, as I said, going through certification right now to be able to really enable these mixed safety criticality, the ability to run a safe operating system on some real-time cores, some non-safe operating systems or general purpose type operating systems on application cores and really leverage the power of the, these heterogeneous SOCs. Excellent. Well, Jeff, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Siemens. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.